If you want to know the best way to treat HIV in the, around the world or even in a developing country, you come to IDI. We have first line, second line, third line. We are able to translate that excellence into the, the reality of Uganda. IDI is clearly that institution that is part of a global process that is constantly scanning the best way to do things uh, and then translating that excellence into what is appropriate for the particular setting in which they are. The Infectious Diseases Institute, known as IDI in Kampala, Uganda, is an example of a center of excellence. It is both deeply rooted in Uganda and fully engaged with global partners. The term center of excellence describes an institution that targets local or regional problems and is internationally recognized for its research, clinical care, and training. Such centers are vital because they generate knowledge, drive policy, and create leaders. Many exist in wealthy nations, but in the rest of the world they are few and far between. The IDI began as an emergency response. This is the time when HIV as an epidemic was just ravaging the population in Uganda and many Previously, young people were showing up on the wards, very sick. And the tragedy is that with all our medical training and all our skills, and even being able to diagnose the problem, you actually could not do much. By the time I got out of medical school, we had a lot of patients and we didn't really know how to manage them. Guidelines were not set, information was not readily available, worse still, drugs were not available. It was clear that the major, a major industry in Uganda at that point the, the, the fashioning of coffins, small coffins for children, large coffins for adults, and all of this was, these are HIV, this is HIV deaths. I lost two brothers because of HIV, and I lost one sister due to HIV. So I actually lost three close relatives before actually the drugs came to Uganda. In the West, people were living much, much longer were converting HIV into a chronic disorder because of the advent of antiretroviral therapy. And yet in Africa, antiretroviral therapy was not available because it was not affordable. But the winds of change were blowing in 2000, 2001. Those winds of change were driven by a global conscience that stated that all HIV positives had the right to have access to affordable treatment. Global forces geared up to send drugs, but a few individuals argued that this wasn't enough. The late Merle Sandy, a renowned HIV expert from San Francisco, articulated a bigger challenge. Merle recognized that we had to do something, but Merle also recognized that the something we had to do was well beyond just providing pills, antiviral drugs. We needed an infrastructure to really deliver those drugs in an informed and intelligent way. Hank McKennell, soon to become chair of the pharmaceutical giant Pfizer, quickly agreed. The world had pretty much made up their mind that pharmaceutical companies cared more about patents and profits than we did about patients. Uh, but telling people that what they thought about the industry was wrong wasn't a very good strategy. I felt we had to actually uh, demonstrate that we could be part of the solution rather than being part of the problem. The third founder was Nelson C. Combo, then dean of the medical school at Makerere University. He believed a well-funded and highly regarded institute could spark a recovery at a public university that had seen decades of hard times. We wanted this institution to be built on a standard of excellence. Right from the beginning, that was our aspiration. Sandy pulled together AIDS experts from around the world. McKennell drove the project forward with Pfizer's resources. D1 Combo and his colleagues lobbied the university for a novel governance structure that would allow a high degree of autonomy. Here we had the opportunity to get the financial systems up and running properly. The building had been done properly. Water and power had to be secured. But it meant by the end we had those systems in place and could start doing the work. The new IDI was built with first-rate labs, clinics, and classrooms. Yet when it opened in 2004, it was almost immediately overwhelmed. People were exhausted. We realized we'd have to change the system. So I think the clinic became a central focus of why we were there. It allowed us as an institute to get our values right. Who were we serving? and how are we going to do that best? 
In its early years, IDI rewrote the Western model for treating AIDS, inventing a new one for Africa. Without expensive viral load tests, clinicians used cheaper CD4 counts. Short on counselors, they created a network of friends, those living with HIV, to testify, counsel, and support those who were sicker. And to manage the huge volume of patients, IDI joined forces to strengthen Kampala city clinics. Eventually, it added services in tuberculosis and malaria. Building a center of excellence in a low-resource setting tends to follow an arc from dependence to independence to interdependence. At first, as with IDI, the center relies on donors and focuses narrowly. Talent comes mostly from outside. In the second phase, it engages with local and national partners, starts to get its own grants, and becomes a recognized source of expertise. IDI is entering the final phase. Global and regional links are strong, and it gets most of its $20 million annual budget directly through grants. When I joined in 2007, I inherited a very vibrant program but that was mainly Kampala-based. And I guess what I've brought in the next six years is to build upon what was already working well, like research and capacity building, but also introduced the outreach program that uh, takes these services, but also the research and capacity building into over half the districts of Uganda. A key partner and catalyst for IDI has been Accordia Global Health Foundation, a small U.S.-based nonprofit created right at the start to make connections, channel funds, and provide management and technical guidance. What Accordia does is to remove the barriers, to shrink that activation energy to, to a level that one can get over the hump and achieve the, uh, the outcome. Accordia has provided the, the type of partnership that succeeds, a partnership that takes the local expertise as equal partners. And yet the story isn't over. Without a tradition of endowments, without the backstop of a well-funded university, without strong and consistent government funding, centers of excellence in low-resource settings are vulnerable. Uh, the, the IDI's greatest challenge now is to diversify its funding sources, which it's doing, and it needs to build itself as a 100-year organization, not a 10-year organization. Institutions in less resourced places need to have extra money for excellence. Excellent people exist in these places, but unless they're able to work in a good environment, they will leave. So the big challenge is how do we continue to get the resources that we need to sustain the excellent work. The Uganda government will have to make a larger contribution. We need to approach uh, the private sector in this country, but a big challenge is sustainability. IDI's impact is undeniable. It has trained thousands, who have gone on to teach hundreds of thousands, who in turn will touch the lives of millions. What uh, I think the IDI has shown is that it is possible in Africa to actually develop a center of excellence, not just in name, but in reality. That is world class. We have a very active board. We have a scientific advisory board. We are always consulting with Accordia. And we have a commitment that we are transparent to all of our stakeholders. This, in turn, has encouraged many uh, to prefer to put their resources with us. Institutions like IDI are critical on a national level. You need institutes like this to drive the research that is locally relevant you know, for the population that is there. This is not a band-aid. This is not a quick fix. This is a solution that's going to require some investment, but you can make a long-term difference. You can fundamentally alter the healthcare landscape of Africa by the creation of a network of centers of excellence. If healthcare and the health of Africa is really your, your benchmark, this is an incredibly, incredibly smart investment.